Hi, I'm Paul Beckwith. I'm at the University of Ottawa with the Laboratory for Paleoclimatology. And uh, in this video, I'm basically going to ask the questions that nobody else wants to ask. Um, often I'm asked um, from people, well, first of all, um, it's kind of difficult in getting a message across in climate change because we still have these beasts called deniers. We still have scientists who are still saying all the time, publishing stuff, saying, oh, this is really surprising how fast it's happening. It's completely biased towards everything's happening much faster than we expect. Well, change your expectations, for goodness sakes. I mean, this, it's ridiculous to always say things are happening faster than expected. You know, delve deeper and ask the questions that are important. You know, I get really annoyed at... Uh, at, at those people. Also, I get, you know, I just, I, I see that I've been talking about abrupt climate change for four or five years and we see it happening. We're just losing, we're right now, uh, the Great Barrier Reef, the largest ecological system on our planet. We're losing it. It's on the death watch. The water was just too warm. 95% of the reefs in the northern parts were bleached and 50% uh, of the reefs probably going to die. Think of the biodiversity. I mean, the earth is losing its ability to sustain life and we're just sitting here. Oh, let's do this policy. Let's do this. Let's, should we, you know, carbon tax or this? It's all like, we're way too late, guys. Come on, get with the program. Do you want people, humans to survive on this planet or are you just going to, you know, uh, go quietly and, and uh, not even try? Uh, so anyway, uh, you know, all the things in the climate system are, it's like dividing by zero. They're going exponential. So I thought this was a really neat example. This is a mechanical uh, calculator. And watch what happens when the guy tries to divide by zero. Right, uh, does not compute. The thing just goes uh, goes nuts, and they have to unplug it. Right, this is abrupt. This, this is a chaotic, abrupt uh, system change. You know, it can't handle it. Well, the climate. You know, can can the biodiversity on the planet handle the massive changes that we're giving it? We're dividing by zero, and everything's going up, spiking, spiking up. So I thought this was a really good example. Um, of that type of thing. So, you know, okay, so look at this. The SMIC report in 1971. Google it. Inadvertent climate modification. Report of the study of, study of man's impact on climate. SMIC, SMIC, MIT Press, 1971. In the report, it says, I quote, we recognize a real problem. Global temperature increase produced by man's injection of heat and CO2 may lead to dramatic reduction, even elimination of Arctic sea ice. Duh. You know, this is like 45 years ago. This is not new stuff, people. This exercise would be fruitless, they say in this report, if we did not believe that society would be rational when faced with a set of decisions that could govern the future habitability of our planet. You know, think about that for a bit. 1971, you know, what's changed? 21 cops. We still don't have a price on card, but I mean, we're fooling ourselves. This is ridiculous. We're, humans are acting so stupid now. Um, there is some hope. I mean, I went to this talk uh, today, a panel with um, Catherine McKenna, the Minister of Environment and Climate Change, and the US EPA head, which her name is Gina McCarthy. Um, she's right here. That's part of her right here. So it was great. I mean, they were talking about the right things. I mean, they've only, you know, we've only had the, the uh, Liberal government for, what, uh, five months, if that. You know, they're, they need to, they're doing stuff fast, but I'm trying to encourage them to do stuff even faster. Uh, but, uh, so I guess there's questions about technology. You know, they're both, uh, both of these the head of the EPA, the head of the environment in Canada and in the US, they, you know, they're saying all the right words or a lot of the right words. We've got to act quickly. This is a big problem. You know, if climate change is the biggest risk to our generation, to humanity, then think of the billions of dollars, the 700 billion US military budget. Put that in, to get those engineers, get those brilliant physicists and scientists and engineers to devise ways to address the problem of our generation, which is climate change, okay? Uh, I mean, it's not, duh, it's not uh, rocket science. Will capitalism survive the robot revolution? This question is asked here. 
Um, you know, the, the, this, is, this is very recent article, okay, from last week. So uh, basically, if 90% of human jobs are replaced by robots in the next 50 years, something now considered plausible, is capitalism the ideal economic system to champion? Okay, well, you talk about this to a lot of people. Talk about this to the N NTHE crowd, the near-term human extinction crowd. They think we're gone in 15 or 20 years. Right? Imagine if we had AI and we put, it, put all the climate parameters that we know into the system. What would it say to do? It would probably say, everybody go jump off a bridge. No, seriously, it would probably say, you know, we have to treat climate change as a global emergency and we have to get moving and, and treat, you know, put in, multi, put in 20 Manhattan projects and Marshall plans and stuff and, you know, mobilize people and technology to deal with climate change. So, you know, this is not happening. Um, so, uh, you know, also the projections on global population are off the charts, right? And they, they don't consider, these economists, these people, they just don't get it, right? They just don't realize the threats that we face. Are we even going to make it that to that uh, time? So, uh, let me see here. What's this? Uh, this is, forget this. Okay, so what can we do? Okay, um, you pro have you heard of nuclear winter? Okay, nuclear winter, the idea of nuclear winter is if, if an H-bomb is, or if you drop nuclear bombs, they kick up enough dust into the upper atmosphere, the stratosphere, they cool the planet for many years. It's like a, like a mega volcano going off. So the question is, is so, so really the question is, what if a war between Pakistan and India went nuclear? What effect would that have? Uh, they each have about 50 or 60 nukes. They're all about 15 kilotons or so. What is that? So what do we mean by, you know, what is kilotons? How much is that? So this is Little Boy and Fat Man, the bombs that were dropped on uh, Japan in World War II. They were both about 15 kiloton yield. Now, the bombs now, of course, are much bigger. And if you put hydrogen around one of these bombs, you generate an H-bomb and the yield goes way, way up. In fact, these are the early H-bombs here and they're like about the thousand kilotons, if you like, or um, actually this is 10,000 kilotons rather, which is 10 megatons. And then you go up to even higher, 50 megatons was the largest yield drop, Sarbamba, the, the, the Soviets dropped that. Uh, they dropped it. They didn't drop it. It was sitting on the ground in a big room. It couldn't be lifted up into a plane. It was supposed to be 100 megatons, and they scaled it back to 50. So let's have a look at what some, some of these things. So what are nuclear weapons capable of? Because people forget about that. We're not talking about nuclear reactors. Reactors can't explode. Sure, Fukushima, they were explosions. Those were hydrogen, chemical explosions, right? A nuclear reactor can't explode like a nuclear bomb. Um, but look at this. This, is, this guy's a scary guy, Davy Crockett. You know, it's a 23 kilogram nuke, tactical nuclear weapon. This is like a suitcase bomb, uh, lightest ever deployed. These things, I think, were, you know, I mean, this is, this is scary stuff. This guy is probably maybe scarier than just about any of the others. Uh, this is Hiroshima and Nagasaki, about 15 kilotons. Um, and then you go to, uh, basically, you know, you, you increase the yield. So this guy... Most powerful pure fission bomb, 500 kilotons, right? It's still much smaller than the bombs we have today because you wrap hydrogen around it and you create an H-bomb. So here we get, uh, you know, we go up here to these H-bombs. You know, this is the uh, teller, uh, you know, was, one of, was the main guy behind the H-bomb, Edward Teller. I actually met him, uh, you know, he didn't regret anything at all he did. I met him in a conference in California years ago. Um, the, the most powerful U.S. test, Castle Bravo, 15 uh, megatons, 15,000 kilotons. And then you get to uh, Sarbamba, 50,000, uh, so 50 megatons. They detonated that on Novaya Zemlin in the Arctic. 1961 or something. Uh, not, let's have a look. Anyway, this is Tarbomba going off. 2.3 kilometer fireball. Castle Bravo, 1.42 kilometer. Um, just giving you an idea, and this is the history of the detonations. Trinity, the first one. Look at the names. Hurricane. Well, that was a fighter in World War II for the Brits. Well, that's they called that's their first fission weapon test, the Hurricane. Then you have these names like uh, 
Star Bomba, you know, was the largest ever tested and so on. And then the Korean ones and the Indian and Pakistan ones, and they're all in the kiloton range. Um, so this gives you an idea of the yields of the nukes. So where, where does that leave us here? Well, if there was a local nuclear war between India and Pakistan, say 100 bombs, 50 each, they're all about 15 kiloton range, what would it do? Well, it would kill about 20 million people in the region from direct bomb blast, fire, and radiation. It would probably starve about a billion people. With marginal food supplies, they'd die of starvation because of agriculture collapse. Okay, um, I mean, the Cold War pretty much ended when people realized that these bombs would cause nuclear winters and take out, uh, you know, a huge number, you know, huge fractions of the planet's population. So this is a simulation. This is uh, May 15th. Nuclear 100 warheads, 5 teragrams of smoke, India, Pakistan. This is five days later, how the smoke would spread. Um, this is how it would spread after, after nine days. It looks like this around the planet. After 50 days, roughly, it's covering the planet. About 10% of the light is blocked on average. In some regions, more. In some regions, less. So only 90% of the sunlight gets through. This cools the planet pretty much overnight. Um, does a number on agriculture, but here's what happens uh, to the planet. Some, from global warming to fast freeze. So here's the temperature projection. The conflict happens. Temperature drops 1.25 degrees Celsius. After 10 years, it's still half a degree lower. Okay, so where does that, this leave us? The yield, if the, the, the total yield, you know, 100, um, 100, we talked about 100 bombs, or about 15 kilotons. So 15 kilotons times 100, 150, 1,500 kilotons or 1 1.5 megatons, which is still far below any of the yields of, say, these MIRVs. You know, a, a, a ballistic missile goes up, there's 10 warheads on it, multiple independently targeted warheads, and they all separate. And each one of those can be 10 megatons, you know, 10 times higher than, than, all, than the total yield from all of the Pakistan, India. So what, here's the idea, okay? Abrupt climate change takes off, we're in turmoil, everything, all hell's breaking loose, uh, we lose crops, everything's going downhill and south, it's too hot, everything's dying on the planet, temperatures just changed too fast, we screwed up completely, we left it too late. Um, by the time we start slashing emissions and stuff, the earth is pumping out stuff. I mean, CO2 was up three, over three parts per million last year. Supposed to be a global emissions level. You know, what's all that about? Is it coming up from the earth now? Uh, because of the warming. So we cool the whole planet. We cool it very quickly and it's free, right? We've got all these nukes. So we just put one of these H-bombs under the ground in the desert somewhere. We detonate it. It sends up all of this dust and stuff up into the upper atmosphere. It cools the planet. How much would it cool the planet? Well, this exchange, uh, India-Pakistan, would cool the planet one or two degrees. Uh, where, well, well, how much was it cool it? Well, let's have a look. Where is it? Uh, Cools it, uh, well, here we go. We already talked about this. It cools at 1.25 degrees in, uh, you know, and it's, it's, it's cooled for a decade. So, so basically, if we, um, you know, if we have a controlled nuclear winter, uh, every few years we pop off uh, an H-bomb under the, uh, you know, that's buried in the soils and it puts up all of the stuff into the atmosphere and cools the planet. You know, when the planet starts heating up again, we, look, we put another one up. I mean, this buys us time, right? This completely stops abrupt climate change in its tracks. It's completely free, basically, because we already have the weapons, and it's like Dr. Strange Love type uh, solution to uh, climate change. We've done lots of open-air nuclear testing in the past. We're still here. I mean, it put radiation around the planet, didn't kill everybody off. So, I mean, I guess, you know, uh, it's... Uh, I was going to put this video out on April Fool's Day, right? And then people would say, oh, he's just joking about all this and stuff. And then, you know, the more I thought about it, I thought, you know, we're, we're so stupid as a, humanity is dumb. I mean, we've, we've completely poisoned our planet, our atmosphere. And, you know, lots of people are saying, give, you know, we're going to go from the public, uh, you know, not much is happening to, holy, holy smokes, you know, total panic in the public. Right, and we're going to have turmoil around the world. We're already getting mass migrations. There's already regions that are can't grow food and stuff. If we want to try to restore the planet back to what we had before, you know, we got to re we have to do the three-legged bar stool type stuff. We have to slash zero fossil fuel emissions. We have to do carbon dioxide removal, um, and we have to try to cool the Arctic. Well, we can 